All right, guys, uh, let's get started. Welcome webinar attendees. My name is Frank Cordero, and today's webinar event is so big that we had to bring on another co-host. I'm joined by Amber Kinnison. Uh, she is the staffing supervisor for CGMA, and um, she's also a talented uh, artist in her own right. Um, and uh, we're glad to have her helping us um, host this uh, particular uh, uh, special presentation that we're going to be doing today. Uh, and um, CG Master Academy is a leader in online digital arts education and film, animation, and games, and we're thankful for their general sponsorship. All right, uh, we are excited to have our audience meet our guest image from the Academy Award nominated movie Klaus. Before we get started, I just want to acknowledge how grateful we are to be doing this webinar against the backdrop of the current COVID-19 situation. When we planned this webinar, everything was business as usual, but much has changed in the last three weeks. We appreciate everyone who's taken the time to join us this webinar. We'll, this allows us to be a little bit more connected to each other and what's going on in our animation world. Uh, so thank you for being a part of our CGMA global artistic community. Um, we have an important announcement to share with you that is a game-changing event for online animation. Manny Fragilis, former lead artist for DreamWorks and now CEO for CGMA, will tell us a little bit more about the amazing news. Manny? Thank you, Frank. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us, uh, especially with everything going on. It's great to be able to come together like this. I would also like to thank our amazing guest animators from Klaus for taking the time to share their knowledge and experience with our community. And uh, Amber and Frank, you know, I'd like to thank them for, you know, hosting this event and putting all this together. So when we started CGMA 10 years ago, it was with the goal of providing affordable, accessible, and relevant education to creatives from all over the world. And for the last 10 years, we've done just that. We've grown to be one of the leaders in online digital arts education. We have students from over 90 countries. Uh, we work with over 200 instructors at some of the top studios in our industries and have taught over 20,000 alumni over that 10 year period. So that's why we are excited to announce the next phase, the next uh, step for CGMA, which is the Animation Master Academy. The Academy will work with all of our other programs, which will allow our animation students uh, to have access to a large warehouse of assets that they could use to create unique animations that will allow their work to stand out. So the Academy will be comprised of four programs, but like all of CGMA courses, you could take individual courses a la carte. This is great for professionals who want to further their skills um, or their understanding of a particular subject um, or who simply want to learn from their peers at different studios. Uh, so the four programs are the Animation Foundation Program, this is a core program for anyone who is new to animation. This will help you get started from, you know, animation for beginners all the way through advanced body mechanics. And then we have three specialty programs. Uh, the first one is performance animation for anyone who wants to learn character animation for animated feature films. We have animal and creature. Uh, it's dedicated to uh, those who want to animate believable creature performances for the visual effects and television industry. And lastly, we have games in real time for students looking to get into games, AR, VR, and other real time industries. Uh, and then we have our animation workshops. And these are short term classes, um, you know, really to help complement um, anyone's animation education. Um, because we know that affordability is one of the main points for our students, uh, the tuition for each of these programs um, is under $4,000, which makes them the most affordable online animation training uh, taught by some of the best artists in our industry. These programs or this academy wouldn't be possible without our amazing advisory board members. Um, lead animator Jason Martison at Real Effects, senior animator Allison Rutland from Pixar, Senior animators, um, animator Lucas Nicholas from An Animal Logic, animation supervisor Fernando Herrera from Framestore, lead animator at Insomniac Games Mike Yash, and crowds animator uh, from Walt Disney Feature Animation Jack Geckler. 
And lastly, we are excited to offer a free course entitled Animation for Beginners. This is a free four week course designed for people with little to no and previous animation training. Uh, this course will cover an introduction to animation and some of its basic principles. Uh, this, is for, this is great for students who are thinking about enrolling into our animation program or who are thinking about pursuing a career in animation. Uh, this is a great introductory course for them. We have some amazing instructors for this course, including Todd Elliott, who is a senior animator at Disney's Blue Sky Studios, uh, Fernando Herrera, who is an animation supervisor at Framestore, um, who's also one of our advisory board members, uh, Lucas, uh, Lucas Nicholas, who's a senior animator at Animal Logic, and Michael Morgan, who's a senior animator at DNAG. Uh, this course will begin on the week of May 11th, but we'll run a couple more sessions afterwards. Seating is limited, so once again, if uh, a career in animation is something that you're interested in, this is a perfect introductory course for you. I must add that we have added a $50 registration fee for this course that only applies to anyone who didn't register during the live webinar last week when we first made this announcement. So if you registered last week, then um, you do not have to pay the $50 registration fee. Um, the link will be attached to the newsletter uh, that we'll be sending out with the recording of this webinar. Um, or you could also go to cgmasteracademy.com, uh, Programs, Animation Master Academy, and scroll down the courses and click on Animation for Beginners. Thank you again for your time. I look forward to seeing you in class and enjoy the rest of your, the rest of your webinar. Take care. This is incredible news for our audience, Manny. Thank you so much uh, to tell us about this new addition to the CGMA family of online education uh, classes. For today's webinar, we've collected questions from registrants in advance and we identified the common themes. So thank you to our audience for your participation in this webinar. And speaking of animation, we wanna introduce you to the main interaction of our webinar and why so many of you are here. The movie Klaus marks as an important milestone in animation history. It's inspired by 100 years of legacy storytelling and animation knowledge, and it takes advantage of modern tools and techniques to help craft a uniquely designed cinematic experience. Here to introduce our three talented guests is Amber Kinnison, a super talented character designer in her own right, and our staffing supervisor at CGMA. Amber? All right, thanks, Frank. Um, anyway, for those who don't know Frank, um, he's a former Disney animation artist um, back uh, in the Disney Renaissance, Renaissance in the 90s. So thank you so much for joining us. And he's the Associate Program Director for CGMA. Um, so I know we're all excited to be here. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Simone Chirillo. Uh, Simone, can you wait? Hi. <laughs> he's a character animator from Italy. Uh, drawing has always been a big part of his life, and he's always been a big fan of animation. Uh, he started his career as a 2D animator working on the Cartoon Network show, The Amazing World of Gumball. Um, his first opportunity to work on a feature project came when he moved to Madrid in 2018 to work at the SBA Studios on Claps. Um, and next we have Cecile Cao. Cici. Hello. Uh, she's an artist from France. Uh, she's worked as a storyboard artist and as a 2D animator on Klaus at um, Sergio Pablo's Animation. And she graduated from Gobelin in 2017. She's also worked as a visual development artist on several commercials and feature film projects. Uh, finally, uh, Giovanni Braggio, um, also originally from Italy. Uh, Giovanni is a 2D and 3D animator. He works for several international studios such as Sergio Pablo's Animation, um, Cartoon Network, Passion Pictures, Red Knuckles, and Golem. His feature film credits include Klaus, uh, Long Way North, Giallo Alemano, a Milano, and he's also worked on the TV show The Amazing World of Gumball. Uh, he also freelanced for many years uh, for short movies and commercials, and during his career Giovanni has lived in the UK, Denmark, Portugal, and Spain. Uh, he currently lives in Rome, where he continues to work as a freelancer. So thank you for being here, you guys. Thank you. Thank you for thank inviting you. us. All right, let's give a hearty warm welcome to Simone, Cecile, and Giovanni. Um, anyway, let's get right to our Q&A questions, because I think we're all excited to do that. First of all, 
how are each of you doing, especially in light of the current COVID-19 circumstances personally? How are you dealing with it? And how has it impacted your work and life, if at all? Um, uh, let's go with uh, Cecile to start with. Yeah, uh, I must say I've been lucky so far. I could continue working normally. Uh, I'm working at Netflix and they made us move uh, to work from home uh, a few weeks ago. And and so far, I don't see a, a big difference in my uh, workflow. And uh, so I'm so far, I'm I'm happy to continue working normally. Okay. And how about you, Giovanni? Um, yeah, yeah, pretty much the same as well. But luckily, we can. I, I was freelancing before from home, so the the, the daily pipeline is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. what, what affects is mostly the, the evenings, I guess, and the weekends. But the working life, it's pretty much the same. Staying at home and working freelancing for for other for other studios in other countries. Okay, that's good. All right, yeah. terrific. And again, you know, probably. For a lot of us who are new to it here in the States, uh, for us, it's easier to get our lunches. <laughs> so long, awesome, great. And uh, Simone, uh, is that the same answer for you or do you have a twist on it? Yeah, no, it's pretty much the same. Like, uh, luckily it's not affecting too much our workflow. And so it's just missing a bit the human co contact with other people, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah. good. All right. Well, good to hear. Um, I um, wanted to know what are your some of, uh, let's get more now into the, what are your some artistic inspirations for pursuing animation as a career? This could be artists, art movements or styles, maybe specific films, anything that kind of got you excited about being in our industry um, or even now, like, you know, because inspiration can change. So I want to start with uh, Giovanni on this one. Um. Yeah, um, big big uh, inspirations so as a child were definitely the Disney classics. That's for sure. And I actually, yes, yeah, it was funny because I never knew in, in there was an industry of animation itself in Europe when I when I was uh, when when I started to do um, to study graphics and, and I was doing graphics and doing comic books. I wasn't thinking of animation because I thought it was just an American business or a Japanese one. And uh, and then I realized there was actually a lot of things going on, especially in France, to be honest, not much in Italy, but yeah, it's, it's getting better in there as well. But yeah, then, so definitely my biggest inspirations were the, the, the anime, because the, the Italy was buying a lot of animes back in the 80s and 90s when I was a kid, and all the Disney classics, I, 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 love, I love those. I, I love Sword in the Stone and Robin Hood and the Jungle Book. Those three were my top favorites. And, they will ever, they will be forever. I, I think. <laughs> I think uh, I would agree with you on Jungle Book, especially. I was lucky enough uh, when I was at animation to actually look at the actual drawings of uh, some of the scenes uh, by Milt Call. Um, the uh, especially the ones with uh, Shere Khan. Shere Khan, yeah. So pretty yeah. unbelievable. Uh, they should be in a museum. Uh, <laughs> totally. Drawings are, and uh, one day I think uh, animation will be looked at in that uh, same light, for sure. Yeah. How about you, Cecile? What's uh, inspiration artistically? What gets you excited? What got you excited? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I agree with what uh, Giovanni said, is that we, we all grew up with animation. When, we, when I was young, I also grew up with uh, Disney movies. But, uh, I, and I loved drawing when I was young, uh, but I think I was more focused on illustration and comic books because it was what was most uh, present around me. Uh, like in Europe, Italy and France, we have a lot of great comic book artists and I think it influenced me a lot. I love uh, Moebius' work, mm -hmm. for instance, which is very famous, I, I, I think. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I discovered animation really lately. And, uh, but I, I was uh, uh, hugely influenced, of course, by Disney uh, movies. Uh, I, I love... Um, Cinderella, uh, uh, they're very old, I really love them. Um, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, uh, the one I, I love, uh, Milt, Kohl's, Milt Kohl's drawings. Um, and, uh, and I'm also a huge fan of uh, Miyazaki's movie. Uh, it's 
wonderful what he can create. It's so uh, also uh, original from a European point of view, I think. So yeah, mm -hmm. these are big influences for me. That's great. That's awesome. And Simone? Yeah, for me, it's pretty much like the other, especially Giovanni. Uh, when I was a kid, I was always like enjoying the drawing and uh, I was a fan of Disney movies. So just like when I was 19, I discovered that animation could be also a job and not just something to watch at cinemas. And then uh, since I started animation school, like my biggest references were the old nine men animators and traditional animator, animators from Disney, like Mikal, Frank and, and Oli and Mark Davis. And like, I think they've been my biggest inspiration through my, through my path. Okay. Now I'm just going to throw this out. I, I didn't ask it, you know, uh, before, but any Warner Brother fans here? Uh, uh, you know, any, um, uh, Chuck yeah. Jones, um, you know, with uh, some of the old uh, Bugs Bunny or Elmer Fudd shorts or Daffy Duck. I ask only because um, that was a, a big part of mine inspiration too, but they did something different than maybe the Disney films did. Um, you know, being that they had to make them for television. Um, so uh, any Warner Brothers fans at all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, of course. As an yeah, audience, yeah. yes. As an audience, I, but, uh, I don't think I could work in such such movies. Not my way of doing things, but I, I, I remember being a huge fan when I was a kid. <laughs> Do you know that one year, I think they created over 50 shorts the old fashioned way in the height of Warner Brothers? That's crazy to me, That the, the fact literally started a short in a week, uh, boards, went to animation, ink and paint, music, audio. That is, I don't know if that'll ever, ever be repeated ever in the history of animation with the old team. Yeah, so it's just mm -hmm. food for thought. But anyway, <laughs> um, crazy, crazy. <laughs> Toon Boom is, <laughs> we got it easy with Toon Boom. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Um, How'd you guys get your first job in the industry? I know that uh, getting a job um, is always a big accomplishment. I remember growing, you know, when I got into Disney, it felt like I, you know, at the time I hit the lotto and I didn't even get in the first time. Um, you know, I submitted a portfolio and uh, they gave me feedback on what to do. And then I waited about six months to a year to reapply. And then on the second time I did, but everyone's got an interesting story about their first job. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what it was like to get your first job in the industry. Let's start with Giovanni. Um, so, uh, well, I, I was pretty lucky because my first job, I got it through my school. So it, um, I got an internship uh, for Cartoon Network, uh, the, but the European studio. So in, in that studio, we were doing mostly advertisements for the channel and for the single shows. And it was really interesting to do because um, I could, I could, basically uh, animate all the different uh, shows of the, of, the, of the network. And back then it was the early 2000s. Uh, the big ones were probably Foster's House for your Imaginary Friend, and Ben 10. Uh, mm. we, I don't remember which one, Laszlo's Camp, <laughs> Chowder. Mm. I mean, I, it was fun. And of course there were all the classics, all the Dexters and Powerpuff Girls, all those characters. It was fun because I could handle different styles. And since we were doing very short identities for the channel or, or little promos, I, I, could, um, I could do the whole thing from storyboard to animate to sometimes even comp comping. So it was really good as an internship. And, uh, and then thanks to those three, four months in London in that studio, then I, I started my first contacts there and, and, I, and I kept living in London and kept working as a freelancer for them. That's a great job, actually. I, I would have loved to have gotten in a situation where I got a chance to do a little bit of everything. I guess at smaller studios, you can do that, uh, which is yeah. great. How about you, Giovanni? I mean, oh, excuse me. Simone, how about you, Simone? What's your yeah. kind of first job in the industry? Yeah. I was quite lucky that uh, when I was in school, I got in, in contact with a studio that it was in the same city as my school, as my animation school, and they were developing an animation short. So they asked me to help with some animation. So this one was actually my first 
job in animation. And then uh, when I graduated in my animation school, I started to send some applications to some European studios and uh, one of them answered me and uh, they asked me if I wanted to join a production there. And uh, so I, like, I simply applied through the, the website and uh, I got an email with an offer and, uh, and then I joined the team. I think pretty, pretty soon after school. Mm -hmm. Terrific. That's awesome. So, I mean, that's the ideal scene. Some of us aren't that lucky. I know and it, yeah. it was about four years before or five years before I got to Disney. Um, took a little time to develop a little bit more, but that's awesome news. Um, so congratulations. Yeah, it was like, I was quite lucky that when I was finishing school, it was the yeah. time that in Klaus, they were looking for animators. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, that was the time that I applied for Cla for joining Klaus team, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it was the right time, uh, and I was like, yeah, the right timing to finish my school and be able to apply for this position for this position. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And Cecile, uh, what was your experience getting into the business? Was it animation, or did you uh, have to do other related? Uh, job before you got to animation? Uh, you mean uh, before I worked as an animator? Yeah. Uh, or uh, generally speaking in animation? No, actually, uh, yeah, I, I, so I studied in Goblin School and I, I was lucky to be there because they have a great uh, network. Yes. And actually, I think my, so I started uh, after my second year in Goblin, uh, I did an internship at Illumination McGuff uh, in visual development. Uh, so it was an internship, but it, it teached me uh, a lot. Uh, I, I learned a lot in understanding uh, how it is to, how, how it works uh, mm -hmm. in a big studio. Illumination McGuff is a big studio. At the time I was working on the Minions, uh, the third, I think. Or the, or the second, I don't remember. Uh, no, Despicable Me, the third, that's it. That's it. And uh, so it was very interesting to see the process, uh, to see all the different departments, uh, how big it is, uh, and uh, how much you can bring as a human to this huge production. I was lucky to do uh, some concept art as well. Uh, so a very narrative uh, drawing. Uh, and I liked it a lot. And, and then, uh, so after this second year, uh, I was post posting a lot of my work, uh, portfolio work on internet, and I got uh, opportunities to work as a freelancer on, as a visual development artist on some production like commercials, um, mainly. And, uh, and when I graduated uh, in 2017, uh, like Simone, it was a <clears throat> the perfect timing to to join the Klaus production, uh, and uh, I was already in contact with Sergio Pablos, who was uh, already looking for to the animators because he knew it was not so easy to find some people who who still uh, like to do to the animation, and uh, and so I joined the the Klaus project first as a story artist and and then as a animation artist. And it was my first in-house uh, job in animation. Perfect. And did you get your animation training there, or had you already been trained um, while at school? But you just started with visual development first, and then went into animation. Or it's an interesting uh, start. Well, uh, in Goblin, we study every job, uh, and it's four years, so you have the time to explore all the different uh, jobs. Uh, skills and uh, and Goblin is really focused on 2D animation. So I already had developed a lot of uh, 2D animation skills. Beautiful. And actually, uh, storyboard was my least uh, strong uh, skill, I think. And I was lucky to have the opportunity to develop that before I could uh, join animation. Did I answer your question? Or? Yes, that's okay. great. I just, you know, um, okay. you know, not everyone starts in visual development and goes into animation. Uh, ah, yes, yes, yes. Visual start in animation the, and then maybe say, you know what, I'm tired yes. of animating. I want to do visual development. Or some people yeah. know that they want to stay in visual development. So it's nice that you can do both, which is mm. great. 
you know. Yeah, depending on the projects and the style, I think it's, yeah, it's good mm -hmm. if you can adapt. To <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you for uh, sharing that information. Amber's going to uh, take over on some of the questions. And um, I also, um, we're also going to get a chance to see some really cool uh, samples of uh, workflow videos uh, that uh, Cecile provided. And uh, of course, you guys jump in on some of the questions, but uh, uh, we'll start with Cecile on this. Uh, Amber, go for it. All right. So yes, so we're going to look at some cloud sequences. And um, first question about kind of your process is, um, when you are given a sequence to animate, like what's your approach? Like what are you, how do you get started? How do you approach it? What do you, what's your thought process? Um, yeah, you just talk about your process. And these mm -hmm. are from Cecile. So Cecile, we'll start with you. Um, if you wanna start talking about some of the roughs here. Yes. Uh, so when we have a shot like this, uh, so usually we are given the whole sequence as a storyboard to, to, to be able to to see uh, the point of the shot in the sequence, to have the big picture. Uh, then we also have a sound. Uh, usually the actors are already recorded. So we have the line, we have the tone of uh, the way they, they talk. So it already gives us a lot of information that we can use. Uh, and I start, uh, so I start with very rough uh, drawings. At, at first I am trying not to be too much uh, not to, to pay too much attention of uh, anatomy and uh, I'm really going with the first uh, impression uh, attitudes to, 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 to try uh, what can give the best, the communicate the best way uh, the purpose of the shot. And uh, then when I have these uh, attitudes, so I play with the very few um, aspects of the characters, like the shoulders, the inclination of the head, the expression and, and attitudes. So uh, to, yeah. And when, when I have these main attitudes, I'm doing this rough version that you can see. It's a little bit more structured. Uh, so it's already very precise, even if all parts of the body are not perfectly drawn. Uh, it's already uh, very precise in terms of uh, movement. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I show this to, to Sergio to, to check if I'm going in the right direction. And then he gives me feedback. Uh, like this uh, version is the first one I show him. And so he thought maybe she was moving too much. He wanted something simpler uh, to focus on the, the way she looks. She anticipates the, the explosion outside and the objects falling. So after uh, multiple attempts, I am, I am showing him each time a new version until he approves uh, it. And I can uh, go to tie down is uh, what you currently are looking at so so when i uh, when i am sure about the intentions i can go further into details and clothes and hair movements and all that stuff yeah yeah i have a question just so the just so the the, the tie downs are, are pretty almost there i guess um what is the difference between your tie down and maybe the next level cleanup i mean the, at that point is is it really that much different? Because I remember we would get tie downs, but the tie downs would be very yeah. depending on how close or how far they were still off or on model. Uh, yeah, actually, maybe you cannot see uh, the difference, but uh, the cleanup artists, they, <laughs> they could tell the difference. Uh, it's, it's in the very small details of uh, character. They have to adjust some, some parts of the body to be... I mean, the cleanup was really, really very precise. It was a very uh, a hard job. The lines are, you know, the lines are, are perfect to be able to make a, a good job later on the process in the coloring and in the lightning. So they needed a perfect line. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh, and of course, there is, there is all the work uh, of uh, in-betweening because here, you see, uh, depending on the shots, uh, I think there are some drawings missing sometimes. So I 
Yeah, here I almost drew everything, but it's not always the case because she's moving a lot, so I had to draw everything. But on some um, on some slower shots, so sometimes uh, we leave a lot of work for the cleanup artist to do the in betweens. So you can see here another example of um, a shot I animated, and you can see the how the first rough is very, very simple. Uh, sometimes I only use dots for the eyes if I don't need to, to go further. Uh, uh, the, import the only important thing for me when I do this rough is that they, uh, the, the, the proportions are respected and uh, I use uh, every element of the body I need to translate, the, to communicate the intention. So what I use is so the, the the head, the the shoulder, the hips, and 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 some basic uh, expressions, and and then when this is approved, I can I can go in the tie down. Yep, terrific. Anything you guys want to add to uh, the process? Um, you know, as far as. Uh, um. Maybe, uh, I don't know, I, I've, I know a lot of people use thumbnails before they start. I, I've tried that a few times, but it's, uh, I don't know, for me, it doesn't really work. I, I prefer to maybe to act it out in front of a mirror or a camera. Uh, uh, well, I prefer the camera because I can, if I can record myself, uh, then I can, uh, I can I can find some little movements I'm doing like uh, without thinking, and those are the things that I like to add in the animation that gives us. Okay, so that's fine. So you're getting up and like you're acting it out and you're recording. Yeah, you're totally. Recording I'm acting it out a few times, and uh, because some somehow when you think of a shot, at least for me, the first idea I, I have it's always the most obvious or the most banal somehow. And when I start to act it out. Physically, and I'm starting to add things that I wasn't, I never think about, even the little gestures. And then the more you do it, and the more you come out with different ideas, like, oh, maybe I should try this other take, or I could try, I don't know, starting with the shoulder, or with the head, and whatever. The more you do it, then the more you start to change the performance and try different things. And then if you have everything recorded, then you can just look at what you did and and maybe take one part that you like or the other. So I, I use the camera if I can, or the mirror. The, but the point is doing it for me, because if I do it with my, with my body, uh, I, I, I kind of uh, assimilate it better somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Simone, anything to add to that? Um, like, yes, uh, I would say uh, also, especially on the tie down process, uh, this is more like a tip that I, I learned during the Klaus process is not to be afraid to, to see the other um, animators work and copy for them. Because it, usually uh, it's nice to see the, the work as a whole team and uh, when, uh, when you're drawing, like I know that it's really hard at, at the beginning to, to draw and model the character. So it's really important to even, to not be afraid to take the model sheet and just import it in, uh, in your file, in your scene, and copy from it. And learn uh, uh, the, um, the shape and all the details. And, and even from the other animators, to not be afraid uh, to copy their drawings and see how they draw the character and learn from them. Because it's, uh, you know, sometimes you, as animators, we tend maybe to be a bit shy or like do just our job without looking the others and just focusing on ours. That sometimes we forget, we don't see that like what the other do can help us. And even like on feedback, uh, asking for feedbacks from the other animators, it's really helpful. Because sometimes when you are working on your scene, uh, you're really focused that you miss sometimes the the obvious or sometimes you just do something that you think people can understand but then when you show to to your colleague or to your friend they they completely don't understand it when they don't understand it's it's not their fault but it's your fault that you cannot communicate uh, your idea 
Okay. Yeah. By the way, you had, you had mentioned model sheets. Uh, I just, I, I saw that you're, and that's kind of bleeds into the, another question. Um, I know we use model sheets on paper. So you, you brought that up. Did they ever make maquettes for the production? Like um, 3D prints or anything uh, comparable for you guys to look at? Uh, yeah. they, did, uh, they did some sculptures, but I don't think we used it that much as an animator. Maybe yeah. to understand yeah. the volumes. Mm -hmm. But since the, the characters were also very graphic, uh, yeah. there were some cheats mm -hmm. that you had to do sometimes. And I think in the end, we, we worked mostly with... Uh, with the work the animator um, supervisors did, because all the supervisors did a lot of animation tests of the main characters before the production started. And we used these materials a lot. We used the, the posing they, they did. We used it, we, they included it in the model sheet uh, pack. Yeah. And, uh, as Simone was saying, uh, we 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 used it a lot. We 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 would try to to use the the expression and the the drawings they did to to understand better the characters and draw draw them correctly. Got it. Cool. Go for it, Amber. Um, I, I, I think they used the. Uh, oh. Sorry, Sorry, go ahead, Joanna. <laughs> now, uh, now I think about it. I think I, the character designer did. Um, 3D model or at least of Klaus. And I think they used it more in lighting than in animation. They, yeah, because yes, yeah. for the animation side, it's was tricky because it's, they're very graphic, even though they don't look like. So um, 3D model wouldn't help that much because for every angle, you have a different graphic solution sometimes. But for the lighting development, it was useful to see how the light was bouncing on the sh which planes were uh, the, the, the the main ones, uh, how the how how the light would bounce on the on the face of the character. I think they use it more in lighting than in animation in this production. Oh wow, that's awesome! I will say I I think that's still you know kind of an unbeatable advantage of two D animation is that you can cheat. You decide what the character looks like <laughs> exactly. from the different yeah. angles. As long as it looks yeah. like it's the same character, you can get away with it. Totally. Um, so I'd love for, um, before we move on to the next question, uh, Simone, I know you were going to do some sketching. So ah, yes, yep. Try if to you want to take it away with that. Um, <laughs> and if you want to tell us um, what software you're going to be using, because I know the audience is interested yes. to know about that. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, we are, I'm using Tumboom, which nice. was the software that we were using for for Klaus. And basically, I'm I'm not really expert in Tumboom. I'm just using it as a drawing software. <laughs> so I'm just creating layers and choosing my brushes, and then uh, start. Love it. Okay, um, I'm gonna draw Jasper. Awesome. Uh, so my next question for you guys is that um, many, I've noticed in Klaus, uh, many of the characters, um, main characters, supporting characters, even the minor ones, uh, they have very distinctive body language. So I know Giovanni already talked about getting up and acting things out, but can you guys talk about how you kind of landed on the key aspects of the body language for different characters and how that set them apart and how it communicated who they were and kind of how that sort of process came about and how they evolved as characters through that? Um, well, for, for Klaus, we, I mean, I was working mostly in the, in the, the Klaus team, like the character Klaus, even though I, I animated a lot of Jasper as well, but that's because Jasper's got a lot of screen time, so everyone had to animate Jasper anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, I mean, it's totally present in 90% of, of, the, of the movie. <laughs> But yeah, anyway, with, with Klaus, we divided ourselves. I mean, we were, we were talking with the, with the team. We were doing meeting with the supervisor and, and, the, and all the animation Klaus team. And we were trying to figure out little things, how, how, how we could solve uh, any issues in the movement or how can we communicate whatever the fact that this guy 
is used to very is used to I don't know chopping woods. He's done, he's done it for for all his life. So maybe we can you can do it with one hand. You can you can do it without looking. So we were having this kind of briefing together, thinking and to to be also to be sure that we were consistent co consistent in our animations. But I think the, the the interesting thing is that a lot of things they just came out organically and automatically without without planning it. It's um, something that I don't know some animators was doing something nice and uh, all of the other were just seeing that and loving it and and we knew that was the way that Klaus would deal with that situation or we knew that was the way Klaus would react to or act uh, in that situation. So. Unconsciously, we were starting to doing it again, and, and the character throughout the movie. The more we were going on, and the more the character was taking a, like a, a solid shape, also in the way he was moving. And uh, it's interesting because it, it comes out very naturally and very uh, organically. And you don't plan it, but you reach a point where you know how he moves and how he would behave and uh, you know that okay this is not the way you would sit down this is not the way you would just with his hands uh it's as if at one point the character you know the character that well the that is is the character himself telling you okay no that's how i would do that <laughs> yeah so the character that's really interesting so yeah the character almost takes on a life of his <laughs> own after a while yeah yeah did they ever um, fill, uh, shoot the video footage of the uh, voice talent doing the acting themselves? Was that part of the way you, you figured out the language, or did you go to other um, maybe inspiration for physicality and language in the acting? Um, the Cecilia, you want to answer that? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we had videos, but the, the actors were not really... I mean, no, I never I used it personally. I don't know if a, a, anyone ever use it uh, they were on the they were available to watch but uh, the actors were, were not doing it for the purpose of uh, for the animators to to use it as a reference they were just moving very uh, not not so much it was not really useful i mean for me but yeah i, I just want to agree with uh, all giovanni said about the <coughs> Uh, the fact that it's a very organic process to understand how a character's move, just just as the the model sheet is an organi uh, organic process, I would say it's the same with the way the the characters move. There th there's always, uh, as for Alva, there was a huge work done by the um, Sergio Martins, the the supervisor on Alva's character. So he was the first to to animate her in a lot of shots. And uh, doing so, I, I guess he he built the character through these uh, initial shots, and then it was a good basis. Uh, and when we would try something, he, we could see if it was uh, consistent with the work that had already been done. Um, and and it's hard to tell. Uh, it's not uh, always very uh, specific. Things it's it's a you, you recognize a character or you don't recognize it just in real life you can recognize someone or you don't recognize him. Uh, it's the same in animation. You the more you know the characters and the more you can say uh, okay this is him or this is not him and that's how it works. Terrific. Well, I know that we answered some of the questions I had um, a little bit earlier. So, I mean, and they've sort of been in touch. Um, I, I Because I came um, from a cleanup background a little bit, um, you know, I, I'm going to ask this part of the question. Um, how, um, I know that you, uh, your drawings um, were very tied down in comparison to what I was seeing um, when working on, let's say, Lilo and Stitch. We'd had a variety of artists who had different drawing styles. So the rough animation stage, it was a lot more disparate, you know, in terms of the individual styles. Um, and sometimes we never got the luxury of what I call a tie down drawing. So in some cases, um, was it a matter of trust um, with the cleanup artists and what they did 
to give them maybe more of a rough than they were used to. Um, Cause sometimes from an artist's perspective, when there's a little bit more room to improve the drawing or improve the, um, the, the character being on model, that was what it made, made it interesting for us to do. Um, uh, sometimes we'd get drawings though from the lead supervising animator on Stitch and we're like, we really don't have anything else left to do on this <laughs> except close the line. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, from a, a, a collaboration perspective, how that was. Were you always giving them the same level of, of tie downs or depending on the deadlines and what you had to do, were there scenes you had to let go because you couldn't do a proper tie down that you ideally would have liked to have done? Uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, that'll be a, a good uh, Giovanni question. Um, well, no, yeah, we were, um, we were actually trying, of course, as much as we could to, to have a, a proper tie down so that cleanup could only focus on the, on the line because they really had a lot to, to deal with already because it was really important that the cleanup lines were uh, very, very precise for the lighting to work. But of course, it wasn't always like that. Uh, I'm, I'd say more than leaving stuff rough, that's not something that happened very, happened very often. We were always delivering proper tie-down animation. So, uh, what would happen maybe is that we would uh, leave a lot of partials or blank frames to, for them yeah. to, 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 to in between, especially at the end of the production where we were rushing more in crunch time when there was no, no, no time. It was Sergio Balbus himself telling us, uh, just, just do partials, do partials, because the cleanup department can handle it. So don't worry, just uh, a lot of animators were their first experience. So there was a little bit of jealousy and, and also, uh, I mean, we wanted to deliver something like completely finished, but it was uh, sometimes it was so much time consuming that there was no, no even point to do it because the cleanup department were also trained animators anyway. They knew how to follow an arc. They knew how to handle uh, in between if needed. So especially in crunch time, we were doing, I mean, at least me, I was doing a lot of partials or I was leaving blank frames if, if, the, if I knew the chart was very uh, mechanic in that in some points. Like, you know, this is exactly uh, the drawing in the middle. So don't, don't need to me, for me to do it. It's just, just follow the chart. Oh, it's great. Good to hear. Um, you know, I noticed that um, in, in the uh, video that uh, Sasuke provided, every once in a while, uh, there would be a rough animated sequence that was as rough as what we got. And that was it. And we'd have to oh, yeah. do that. We'd have to go from that rough and put it. So uh, on the one hand, those drawings took longer. Uh, but on the other end, it was more satisfying uh, artistically because we were helping contribute in a way that maybe normally a super cleaned up drawing may not have always allowed for. Um, so it's just interesting to kind of see and hear the conversation about what the concerns are. Um, you know, then of course you get animators like Eric Goldberg. I don't know if you remember him. Um, Eric Goldberg did a yeah. film from Hercules and he's, he is known for having probably um, one of the most razor sharp drawing lines you'll ever find as a first pass. I mean, it's almost un unreal. So, uh, and not all animators work that way. Uh, that is a, a rare exception where what they draw is pretty much the defining version of the drawing. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, it doesn't happen often. But anyway, um, Amber is going to kind of segue to talk a little bit more about the technical side of Klaus and some of the challenges. Um, so Amber, why don't you go ahead and lead those questions. And, and, and it looks like... Uh, Simone has made some amazing progress on his, his drawing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, for yeah, me, really. it's done. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's done. <laughs> good job, good job. Yes, thank you. Looks great. <laughs> wow. It's, 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 always, it's always miraculous. Um, starts with the ear and then they just become the character, you know? So, um, uh, do yeah. you going to be uh, a chance to do his uh, drawing? Uh, yeah, since. we're going to hand, hand the screen share to Giovanni now. All um, right. He is going to show us Klaus. Uh, All right. <coughs> this my pen. Okay. While we get into some more questions about production, um, 
So kind of starting with a broader question, what were some of the biggest challenges for you guys during the production of Klaus? Um, Simone, why don't, why don't you start with that? Just some challenges yes. for you during the production process. I would say also like something related to some, topic, some topics we were talking before. Uh, like uh, I think uh, the biggest challenge for us was to get the same quality as the teaser of Klaus or as like as Sergio was expecting from, from us. And uh, I think, yeah, this, the quality level uh, uh, related to the time that we had to animate and of course like uh, to, to be able to finish the movie on time. And what I would say like even related to the process, uh, usually when uh, we were working on our sequence or our shots, uh, we get like a bunch of shots all together. So we can choose from uh, these three or four shots, like maybe the most important of, or the, the, the most complex. So like we know that we will focus more our attention to that shot and uh, uh, so maybe for that shot, we will be really precise on the tie down, doing all the in-betweens by ourselves or, or like cleaner drawings. But maybe for other shots, we can do less in-betweens to be faster and uh, to leave like for the cleanup department to, to finish it for us. And uh, or maybe like even balance, balancing um, about like, if, if in, in a shot you get more characters to focus your attention or, and maybe the others can be even for just, I don't know, keys and betweens and then leave it for the cleanup, you know, just to, to really put your energy where you need to and not to like do everything at your best. To, to be able to survive for the whole production. <laughs> so pacing yourself, basically. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, because of course you want to animate every scene, every shot, like, uh, your, as it is your best one, but you can't. Like, you just need to... Uh, sometimes it's even too much to animate uh, something that doesn't need to be animated that much. I don't know if, he, if it's clear enough. Yeah. Uh, but you know sometimes it's for some cases it's it's even better maybe like a, a drawing so you don't need to waste so much energy and it's more uh, you can communicate more with just one drawing instead of doing so much movement uh, what about you Cecile what, your, what were some challenges for you uh, yeah I, I agree with that I feel but I think it's true for um, every production um, sure you work on is to keep always keep in mind the big picture uh, so what's the point of the shot you're doing as Simone said does it need so much energy that you're going to put in it where should you prioritize uh, uh, your energy and your attention uh, and same on when you animate a character you need to to remember yeah the point of uh, of the shot what do you need to communicate in that shot? And uh, when, you're, you, when you love anim to the animation, sometimes you are tempted to, to show off, to do a lot and to, but uh, sometimes less is more. So you need to keep all this in mind. And uh, most of all, you need to understand the point of the director. So when you are briefed on a shot, you need to, to be able to to anticipate the choices you're going to have to make, ask questions to the director, uh, make attempts, understand the feedback, do it again. And, uh, and the best way to, to succeed is to, to understand first the job you have to do, the message you have to communicate. And then there are all the technical aspects. So this pro project was really challenging uh, in terms of technique of course as uh, as we've said before it, it was uh, the teaser was a uh, very uh, beautiful and uh, and we were trying to get uh, the same quality on a feature film 
so the the character designs are really subtle uh, volume and graphic in the same time and the way they move it's also realistic in some shots and more cartoony in other shots and you have to balance all this uh, when you work uh, so you you have to understand the tone you are looking for and the message you have to communicate keep the big picture in mind and focus on the technical skills later yeah so yeah it's a it's a lot to deal with yeah sure but, uh, um so talking about kind of the the style and everything uh can you guys talk about some of the experimentation and that went into figuring out the visual style because it is very graphic but then at the same time there are things that are very realistic and then pertaining to how the characters move like you said there's the balance between making it feel real and really pushing kind of the cartoonier shots um because i think there were some smear frames in there too at least for a couple of the characters um so yeah how, can you kind of talk about the the look of it and the style of it well, like um, yeah, we we were mostly involved in animation, so like we I wasn't like we weren't involved in uh, creating the style sure. of the movie. But what uh, what I can say and I will, what I can remember is that like of course the style was quite uh, graphic, but the the treatment for the lighting or like the textures and everything. Uh, is feeling quite realistic in a in a way, and uh, especially like on uh, how lights could work on uh, on something. I think it was quite uh, realistic in that way. And uh, for like the balance between cartoony and realistic, I guess like it depends on uh, it depends on the shots and on the moment of the movie. Like uh, some moments of the movie was really subtle animation and so needed to be really realistic and uh, but for some moments especially with jasper the animation was quite cartoony and uh, yeah for example with klaus was never never cartoony at all <laughs> yeah. And, yeah yeah i i feel like some of the it was more the um some of the more comedic moments with jasper that were like really yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah exactly and it's it could be cartoony, not just in the way the animation is done, but it, just even on the acting choices that you make. Uh, it doesn't need to be like a lot of squash and stretch to be cartoony. It can even be just like about the choices that you make for your performance. And Klaus was really like subtle and realistic, and more contained as an animation. And Jasper it depends on the moment, but there were some moments. It was really subtle, and others were. It was really comic. Mm. Yeah. Um, Cecile, anything to add? Um. Uh, on the style, uh, no. I guess uh, yeah. We 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 said uh, everything. I, I guess there was a. Uh, yeah, was as I was saying before, there was a big job done by the supervisor animators to translate the the design uh, that Torsten Schrank made, uh, the character designer of the movie, uh, to translate this design into animable characters. Uh, and some characters changed a bit, like Alva, I know she changed a bit uh, for the sake of having a consistent character through the movie um but uh, m more or less we we stayed very close to the initial drawings by torsten but uh but yeah just to find all these tricks uh to draw the characters in every angle in every expression and even when they are acting uh, in a very cartoony when we have squatch and stretch these are all uh, uh these drawings are mostly uh done by the animators they they are the one who find the solutions in the animation process awesome um and then oh and we have klaus joining us now 
Um, so next question, another kind of technical one. Um, in the past, uh, characters in 2D animated films, they have always been filled with flat color, um, beautiful bits. You know, the, the backgrounds are shaded and everything and, and more volumetrically lit and then the characters are flat. But obviously in Klaus, that is not the case. Uh, they're volumetrically lit in order to fully integrate into the world of the film. Um, so can you talk at all about the technique that was developed for this and maybe how that affected your work? It sounds like it, could fit, it affected the cleanup artist's work because they had to be like perfect in order for all the lighting to match um, the art. So um, yeah, if you guys can talk uh, at all about that. Uh, Giovanni, why don't you uh, start with that since you've been drawing. <laughs> Sorry, how, how the lighting affected the animation? <coughs> um, yeah, it was, it, that, that's something that never have, um, for me, never happened before. We were really, to, to, we, we had to think a lot about the final look and sometimes we have retakes on that. Uh, maybe we are adding details to what, which were not really necessary. Sometimes we were doing stuff and Sergio would be like, oh, you know, if you leave the thickness of whatever, the, the tip of the nose of the, of the, or of the ear, that will really had something in lighting, so maybe uh, let's keep it that way. Because or add add that little bit because it's a little thing animation. But then when we shade it, it's gonna it's gonna look way better. Yeah. So we had sometimes that kind of feedbacks and or even just in the design. Uh, I remember sh Jasper shoulder straps. They had these two rings. But uh, originally they were meant to be like buttons. They were to have a, like a flat surface and then a rounded mm -hmm. thing, and that would have killed the, <laughs> the lighting department <laughs> <laughs> to like that thing throughout the whole movie. So we had to change design and and have two two cylinders basically. So yeah. it was easier. You had just two parallel surface and and a thickness. So just for yeah. the record, I mean. I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, I, I just got me thinking like uh, that was a very big deal in terms of like adding um, even simple things like how many stripes are on, um, you know, the character's costume. <laughs> that yeah. additional stripe could literally turn into literally hours of work dominoing down the pipeline. So <laughs> this is on the design front and, and how that affects animation and then lighting. That's like literally exponentially adds time so yeah totally it's the same, same with same with jasper i remember we had yeah. at the very beginning the the, the 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 button on the on the on the skirt on the on the uniform were uh six i think and then when we started the animation they were down to four and yeah. i think there were some two more on the on the upper part of the uniform that were removed yeah, yeah. all these the are yeah we just a lot of these little details were, little were removed just to just speed up the process. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> um, Cecilia, was there anything for Alba that you guys had to think about um, when you were animating her in order to in order to carry that through? Um, I don't have such uh, examples as uh, what Giovanni said. With Claude. Alba was pretty simple uh, as a character. She was very, uh, she had a lot of organic elements, like she had her hair moving, uh, changing always, and and uh, she's wearing like a kind of a scarf, a big scarf. And so um, I don't know how they dealt with this kind of, uh, we, we didn't do anything it didn't have any consequence on the way we were drawing Alva the fact that there was some work done in lightning later so we were very lucky uh, she she was the most graphic character I think Alva because she has this very weird uh, pointy uh, uh, chin and and she's uh, yeah she doesn't have sharp uh, edge volumes like Klaus so I think she was simpler maybe uh, as a character to, to work on uh, for lightning artists. Yeah. So we didn't have too much trouble with the design. And then I know um, there was some 3D used in, in part of the movie. Um, so can you guys talk about where you, uh, 3D was utilized? Um, Simone, I'm going to start with you on that one. Yeah. I remember 3D was used mainly uh, for some uh, props. Mm -hmm. uh, or some reindeers, but like maybe where they were really far away from screen or like 
they were really small in the uh, in the scene. And uh, I think for the characters we never used 3D. Sometimes we had some 3D uh, puppet to use as a reference for uh, maybe some camera movements or other other more complicated shot. But I think. Yeah, rarely there were characters in 3D. I think never. I don't remember exactly. Maybe it's some in some few shots. But yeah, like 3D was supporting. I think the the animation where where when it was too hard to do it in 2D, uh, 3D was helping a lot. Um, Giovanni, anything to add? Uh, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's interesting maybe because the, to know that we were trying to, to at the beginning we were, we were doing some trials and some attempts and we were trying maybe to, to see if uh, having some elements in 3D would speed up the process. So we, for, for, in, in one moment we tried to have a, because two moon can import 3D object, objects. So the, we try to import uh, the, the hat of Jasper because it's really difficult to draw. The, the shape of the hat was really hard to get. So we try to have a 3D one to see what's easier or the, the antlers or the reindeers we tried, but then we ended up not using it at all because it was actually more time consuming to, to handle this 3D object in, in Toon Boom rather than just to, to draw it. Uh, so just drawing it ended up being faster than yeah, any and drawing it, <laughs> exactly, and yeah, spe especially because most of most of the animators didn't have a three D background, so they had to learn how to deal with a three D object first. And to boom, it's it's working really nice with drawing, but it's not meant to be a three D software. So you could do yeah. some animation, but we try with doors as well to animate those in 3D in, in Toon Boom, but then we gave up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I mean, doors that were, were animated uh, in Maya lately by 3D animators. But yeah, those things like the head or the antlers were not really successful ideas. It was just easier to draw. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and in some cases, that is usually the case. Um, it's ironic that the industry took, you know, fell in love with 3D, but then we come full circle. It's like, yeah, drawing is still very much yeah. a so um, kudos to keeping the, the drawing yeah. alive, uh, even in comparison to 3D, which is, you know. Yeah, when, when, I do, when I do 3D animation, I always, I'm often end up saying, oh, it would be just so much easier to draw this. Sometimes <laughs> you just have to, to deal with to, yeah, it. It takes hours to, it takes hours to, to pose a character, to, to do some I know, fold in the clothes or a year, a uh, tier, I don't know. <laughs> things that in 3D would be just one quick line and that's it. And then in 3D, you just struggle hours to try to, to get it right. <laughs> you know, you should have, that, that would have been interesting to tell the, the leaders of, um, of animation or even the executives back in the, the, the early 2000s when they were closing. Because if we were to take that story arc and come full circle 20 years later and say, you know what? Drawing it is still faster. <laughs> 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 they were thinking, no, it's not. And uh, it's funny, but uh, I love to hear. I love to hear the drawings still win. All right. <laughs> um, speaking of which, uh, back when I was um, hired at Disney, um, not everyone came uh, from a school like uh, Ringling uh, or even um, Cal Arts. There weren't as many animation schools. I know that for a fact. Um, you know, they, you had to go to you know, different parts where we, you know, Cal Arts was one of them. And then in Vancouver, they um, had Sheridan and they probably had other schools in Europe that I wasn't aware. But if you weren't near a school, a lot of times Disney hired um, people who had illustration and drawing backgrounds uh, and then they trained them to become animators um, at Disney um, for in an internship. I'm not sure if that pathway exists anymore uh, with so many people now interested in 2D. Uh, I guess my question is, to get a job, are they expecting you to know how to animate from the word go, or is there a pathway for people who know how to draw well, but maybe haven't learned animation? And I'll um, just, I'll keep that open. Uh, Cecile, uh, do you want to answer that? Um, so excuse me, what, what's your question exactly? The question is this, um, was could you know how to draw, um, 
in animation without having the animation training or um, expect you getting a job now to know how to animate. As an animator without uh, being trained as an animator before. I, yes. I don't think it's, uh, I mean, I don't have a big experience in the animation industry, but uh, I feel like now there are so many animation schools uh, and I would say definitely the drawing skills, draftmanship is a is a pre uh, is is a how do you say uh, like you you have to know how to draw to become an animator, but uh, you also need to to master some animation skills, and and I don't think the studios have uh, have uh, time to to teach this to, 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 to people, so they, they, will, they would ask uh, people to be already trained, I, I guess. I don't know if you, uh, uh, Simone, or yes. do you have uh, any other experience about that? Like, I think generally when uh, we started in, uh, in Klaus, everyone was already an animator, so there was a training moment for us, but I think uh, there were people, they already knew how to draw and how to animate. Uh, the difference is that uh, we had this training moment before the production started uh, to get to know more the characters and the style of the movie. And it was really helpful for us. But I think now, now in general, uh, studios are more looking for people that they already know how to animate and uh, how to draw. Like, I think it's hard to hire people that can draw now, and uh, but it doesn't know how to animate. I think in 2D animation, it's half and half. Like you need to draw well and uh, also animate well. Yeah. Ivani, you want to jump in? Yeah, no, I just, I guess it's because now there are so many animation schools around that uh, back in the 90s or before, uh, a studio was maybe okay to commit and invest time on training people. So you just go to a studio, you show your drawing skills, and they're like, okay, we'll invest time and money to train this guy and learn how to animate because we would need lately animators. But nowadays there are so many schools, animation schools, that it's really rare that a studio uh, wants to in invest that much on a single person. So yeah, you just have to already know how, how to do it, how to animate, definitely. That's so, great. I'm just gonna say, all that being, I was gonna say all that being said, um, we had a lot of um, students and aspiring animators uh, join the webinar. So could you give some advice to students and new animators on how to, keep, how to keep pushing their work and how to keep improving as artists and in order to work towards getting that first job? Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. The, the, I mean, like the classic, the classic uh, thing to say is, of course, to to do it as much as you can, because as any form of art or anything else in the anything else in the world, from math to football to whatever, it's all a matter of practice. It's mostly a matter of practice. I believe in genius, but not that much. I think if you 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 can have uh, predisposition, of course, but uh, it's only the hard work that makes you uh, a, a, a good uh, artist or a good draftsman. And you just need to do it. You need to do it a lot and fail a lot. And the more you fail, the, the better you get. And exploit the moment where you're in school because you don't have a client pushing and pretending from you. So you can, you can do a lot of mistakes and you later know what not to do. <laughs> and uh, and then another advice, which is contradictory to this one, <laughs> that students tend to do a lot, and I used to do it as well, is not to, to not get obsessed with this job, to not get obsessed with, the, with, with your art, whatever it is, with animation or whatever it is your, your thing. Because especially in animation, we, we, we are storytellers, we are telling a story, even if you're not boarding or you're not directing the movie the way you're animating a character and, and the, may, the way it moves and the, how it gestures or the, whatever it does, uh, in, in the way of, with the movement, you're conveying emotions and you're, and, and you're telling a story anyway. And if you lock yourself in your room 
and just spend all your life sitting at that desk and drawing, you will have nothing, nothing to say. Plus, your mind will be completely stuck. So I guess the good advice is not to get obsessed and live a life and get out and, and uh, stay with friends, make experience, travel, <laughs> dance, play football, whatever you like. The more you, you, more you experience, the more you will have to give to your character once you have to move them. So go out yeah. and draw, go, go get inspiration from somewhere that isn't right in front of your computer. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> when, when it's on your desk. Pick up a hobby that is uh, uh, going to support your interests as an animator. Learn more about movement. Um, I know uh, when I was uh, in, uh, at Disney, I got a chance to take some dance, ballroom dance lessons. Uh, and that was great to learn about where the movement starts in ballroom. And that transferred over to a lot of my uh, drawing and artwork. Uh, so yeah. things like that, that help you, you know, martial arts are great uh, to know how the movement starts, uh, you know, things that just get you out of yourself. Uh, even acting classes, you know, I'm sure are good compliments uh, to being a, um, involved with animating. So yeah, life is good. Get, you know, go, go, go meet a girl, get your heart broken. Know what that feels totally. like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I know for me, um, when I started training in martial arts, it it really like gave me a much clearer understanding of how everything in the body is connected, and because you have to if you're if you're training in something like that, you have to. Um, and I know, yeah, you mentioned acting classes. I know some board, a bunch of board artists who've taken improv classes just to, you know, just to push that movement and 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 see you know action and response and things like that. So, yeah. Mm. Um, I guess you want to finish off, Amber, with the last question. Um, uh, sure. Um, what can what do you guys think junior artists and newly graduated students can do to make their reels stand out from the crowd? So you know, recruiter, or director, or producer, they get this, or I guess not a pile of things, but like, you know, all all these links to portfolio or, or to demo reels. Like, what makes somebody stand out um, from the crowd? Well, uh, I think for me, uh, something that could be a tip could, if you want to be an animator and you're applying uh, for any animation jobs, first of all, you need to look uh, and to understand like the studio where you're applying to and trying to make and build a reel that can be exactly for the studio is looking for. And, uh, and then what I would like to say maybe what I like to do in my showreel is to add maybe a small personal intro to introduce my my showreel. You know, when uh, when you write uh, your name and then showreel of uh, 2020, I think it could be nice to add a small intro, um, like a personal work. I really like when people can show personal work because you see uh, when uh, someone... Um, what he's doing when doesn't have any other inputs or deadlines or other stuff to to take care of, and so like I think uh, personal work could be something interesting to see, uh, where you can even show something a bit more yourself. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Cecile, what do you think? What's been what uh, yeah think helps people to stand out? They're real. Uh, I don't know. I don't really know what stands out. I never had to choose uh, anyone by uh, watching their reels, but I would say maybe keep in mind that uh, the studios are looking for someone to work on a project. So they need to know that you can uh, be able to communicate an intention to fit in a project. So you, uh, you are a good communicator with drawing. And you can see the big picture as well as zooming into the tiny details because we need both of these skills to work in animation industry. So if your showreel can show this, your capacity of communicating something and having the big picture also to 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 see if people are gonna are gonna understand the message you're 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 communicating and and that you're not only focused on the details. It's it's a it's a good thing. Yeah, that, yeah, that would be uh, my uh, advice. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Uh, 
This has been an amazing 75 minutes of inspiration and information. We're so glad to have Simone, Cecile, and Giovanni take the time out of their busy schedules to be a part of this really special webinar and um, also part of our very special Animation Masters Academy. We're all grateful for your time, your talent, the drawing demonstrations, your enthusiasm and passion for uh, really an amazing art form. I think uh, we didn't care about drawing, uh, movement, performance, storytelling, all these things that are what animation is. And uh, so for that, we're, we're grateful for that and um, for helping us make this super, super special.